Well, good morning, everybody. It is time for something new. It is time to start a brand new series, and uh, we're going to dive into it this morning. It is called Authentic. Um, the theme of this series is going to be proving that the Bible is exactly as the author intended it to be, even after all this time from when it was written. We're going to prove that uh, the Bible we have today carries the same message that, that its original author, an author we posit is God himself, even though he worked through over 40 different people, to uh, approximately 40 different people to bring us that message, that it's the same message. And we're going to be looking at some criticisms that come against the Bible that try to uh, deprive it of its claims to authenticity. And hopefully what this series is going to let us do is shore up our own faith, but also be able to answer the questions that uh, friends and family and loved ones have when it comes to why we believe what we believe. So with that said, why don't we bow our heads and close our eyes, acknowledge the presence of the Lord with us this morning as we start out on this new endeavor. Father, we thank you. We thank you in Jesus' name for the time, the space, the ability to be able to present material like this, material that goes beyond the average Sunday school class, material that certainly goes beyond the average Sunday morning sermon that seeks to educate, inform, and equip members of the church, disciples of Christ, for the good work of giving a reasonable defense for their faith. As we endeavor to do this, Lord, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would anoint it, that you would guide my words and give clarity to my thinking as I present this information, and that you would open the eyes, the ears, and the hearts of everyone within the sound of my voice to hear these things and to be aware of what they're listening to, to, to see readily the places in which questions are being answered, maybe that they've had for a long time or that they know that loved ones have had and that they'll be able to answer now. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, the people of God said, amen. Well, all right, so this, this new series, um, we're going to kind of kick it off with an int introduction, you know, this morning. And one of the things I hear, and if you're listening, you know, to this morning and, and you're not a believer, we, we hope that you'll consider the information that's being presented here. We hope that it answers your questions. One of the things that we hear the most is that the Bible is old-fashioned or, or that it's outdated, it's expired. And it may seem old-fashioned to take the Bible seriously, especially in our modern age of scientific discovery and multicultural emphases. It's become politically correct to deny the existence of absolutes and to deny the involvement of our creator in our day-to-day -day affairs. And yet there are many intellectual and very well-informed people who take the Bible very seriously, who even regard its origin as supernatural. It is, it, we do not stand for an unreasonable faith in this church. The series we just finished that we entitled Logical was a series on critical thinking. It was a series on right thinking, right reasoning. And, and we posit that that comes from a biblical worldview. Now, Ultimately, there are two basic worldviews that we can hold. One view regards everything we experience as the result of some cosmic accident. In the beginning, there was nothing, and then it exploded. The other view is that everything we experience is the deliberate result of our Creator. Of course, there are numerous variations on each of these views, but each of us must decide where we will place our trust. And each of these worldviews holds possible solutions to the biggest puzzles in life. Puzzles like, who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? And perhaps most importantly, to whom am I accountable? It is ultimately important that we find the true answers to these questions. Now, the Bible, when thoroughly and intellectually, honestly examined, will prove itself to still be relevant today. It is unchanging, and it is relevant. But people have fair questions that deserve to be answered. Where did the Bible come from? Why do we believe its origin is supernatural? Who defined what is called the canon of Scripture, those books that are included in Scripture? And why are other books not included? In scripture 
<clears throat> Most importantly, the bottom line question that we seek to prove in this series is, is the Bible the Word of God? And we're going to do this in two series, okay? This first series called Authentic, we're going to prove that the Bible must be what it claims to be on the basis of, of where it comes from, and we're going to dispel a lot of rumors. The next series we're going to do is going to be called Accurate. It's going to ask, answer the question, is the Bible accurate? Is it accurate historically? Is it accurate archaeologically? Is it accurate scientifically? And perhaps most importantly, is it accurate prophetically? That's where we're going, but if we can't understand first that the Bible is authentically what it claims to be, we really don't need to care whether or not it's accurate, right? So... We have to decide if the Bible is the word of God, and you and I both, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, whether you accept the Bible as the inspired word of God or that seems foolhardy to you, we are both gambling our eternity on the answer to that question. Within recent years, many members of Protestant denominational churches and the Roman Catholic Church have turned away from the Bible as the fully inspired word of God. We hear arguments that the Bible contradicts itself or that it contradicts the truths of modern culture and science. Many people say the Bible contains the word of God but cannot be relied on to be the word of God in all its entirety. And this is a key issue. Is the Bible really true? How do we know? A lot of times you, you, people make this, this, this comparison to that children's game that we would play that was called the telephone game where you sit in a circle. And somebody starts out with an original message and then they whisper it into the ear of the person next to them and that person repeats the message they heard into the ear of the person next to them and so on and so on. When you finally get to the other side of the circle, the first person says the message that they told, the last person says the message that they heard and, and they can be radically different messages. It changes over that period of time. And people try to say that because the Bible has been translated and, and copied, that errors have crept in over the course of time. So therefore, the, the message that we have today in our language is not necessarily the message that we had originally when the Bible was penned 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Is that true? Or has the Holy Spirit overseen and protected the transmission of the message so that we can rely on it as authentically being what God intended to get to us? How do we know? Those are questions we seek to answer. Here's some promises that come from Scripture. Jesus in Matthew 5.18 says, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle will, will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. And for those of you who don't know, in the speak of the time, a jot or a tittle, they were like the, the dot of an eye or the crossing of a T. Jesus was literally saying the smallest piece of his word would not pass away until it was fulfilled. That's a promise that he protects his text. Here's another example out of Jeremiah that's pretty on point. Jeremiah 33, 20 through 21 says, Thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that there will not be day and night in their season... Then my covenant may also be broken with David, my servant, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne and with the Levites, the priests, and my ministers. And the bulk of the Old Testament is a buildup to the line of David taking the throne of God's chosen nation, Israel, ultimately bringing us to the place where Jesus himself, the Messiah, is a king in the line of David. The promises to David go from practically Genesis to the book of Revelation. And what God is saying in this verse is you would have to make it so there was not day and there was not night in their season before I would break that promise. Those promises are contained within his word. So we have a high degree of confidence that he takes the authenticity of his word very seriously. Next, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 say, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, that's teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's a pretty amazing promise when you take into account that 
we, whether you're a believer and an unbeliever, can look at that and say, if we choose to follow what God has placed in this book that he calls his inspired, his God-breathed message to all of humanity, you will lack nothing. You will be completely equipped for every good work. That's his promise. We have something invested in the Bible being authentic. Do you understand what I'm saying? And we have to know how to back that up. So our premise here is that, yes, the Bible is authentic. If we are to trust this book, we have to know the message then is the same as the message now. And that is the path over the next several sessions that we will endeavor to uncover together. Why do we believe that? Why do we have such a high degree of confidence in that so that you can have that surety for yourself and so that you can answer that for others? Now, as a way of introduction to this topic, I thought it would be really good if we discussed first some common criticisms of the Bible, many of which I'm sure you have run into in your own lifetime, or maybe you, uh, as an unbeliever, have dealt with these in your own life. They're questions that you have, or they're, they're excuses you have given for not looking at it and dismissing it out of hand, because people do that, and we understand if you have, but we encourage you to listen to what we're saying, because we think we have answers to that, that. In fact, we know we have answers to that that are both convincing and uh, transformative. We want you to hear them. <clears throat> so we want to know and understand the historical roots of modern biblical criticism because it will greatly help us understand why this field of study can never produce any good results. And so I'm speaking of modern biblical criticism. We're going to discuss a few key points, but if you're taking notes, this is something that you would want to jot down because I'm going to use criticism in, in kind of two ways in this series, and I wanted to kind of put it out there up front. When I say biblical criticism, I'm, coming, I'm, I'm defining a term, historical or higher criticism. We'll get to those terms in a minute. Biblical, historical, or higher criticism is, is a methodology that arose in history to, to pretty much say the Bible is not what it claims to be. Okay, so when I use, okay, we're good. All right, so textual criticism, as I was saying, is the, the sign uh, or the scientific study of actually analyzing any ancient text. So biblical criticism is attacks against the Bible. Textual criticism, that's a good thing. In fact, I'll just throw the statistic out there. We'll prove it a little bit later. But the science of textual criticism, through that, we've been able to determine that from the earliest documents we have, all the way to the text that we have today, that we can determine it's the original message to 95.9% accuracy. And of the remaining 5%, it's a spelling error here or a small grammatical error there. Not one point of doctrine falls into question because of the 5% of textual errors in the manuscripts of the Bible that we have that should question anything that we believe. That is an impressive number. So biblical criticism is something that we're going to debunk. Textual criticism is something that we are going to use. Does that make sense? Just want to make sure those terms are out there from very early on. Okay, so a brief history. So as the Catholic Church rose to power around the time of, of Constantine, when, when, when religious power got concentrated in, in uh, both Byzantium and Rome and then eventually almost exclusively in, in Rome throughout the Middle Ages, there came a point where it became illegal to read the Bible in your own language. Latin was the language of the Roman Empire, and then what happened from that point forward was uh, translations of the Bible into the common vernacular of, the man, of man, whether that was German or that was English or that was Dutch, whatever languages began to develop, that became illegal because the Pope was said to be infallible and the church elevated the traditions of men to the same par, the same level of authority as what scripture had to say. So on the one hand, the church had a doctrine where the priests needed to interpret scripture for you because they were the only ones educated in the language to be able to read it and tell you what it said. But then whatever traditions the church had, those were of the same level of authority. And we came to a time where... It's called the Protestant Reformation, kicked off by the man Martin Luther, where 
he came to an understanding that it's not works that saves us, it's grace through faith that saves us. In a very bold move, he put 95 problems that he had with the Roman Catholic Church, and he nailed them to the chapel at Wittenberg's castle and sparked a, revol a revolution in history. And that's where we began to get the different denominations that exist in the church. Because the Bible was used to criticize the traditions and the authority of the Roman Catholic Church, okay? But what happened at this time was the Catholics didn't take that lying down. They began to take their doctrines, read them into the Scripture, and attack the Protestants for what they believed, and it just started going back and forth. Now, as men and women got into the Word of God, as like Martin Luther translated the Bible into German, and his other men translated it into French or translated it into English, and more people got access to things. There were more traditions of the church that people discovered weren't really what the Bible taught. And that's really important because a lot of common misperceptions about what the Bible teaches exist in the world today because at one point or another the church taught it, but this is something we got to get clear from the very beginning of the series. Just because the church teaches something doesn't mean it's what the Bible says. Just because the church teaches something doesn't mean God approves of it, and it doesn't mean that it's biblical. And so if you're not a believer today, or if you have loved ones that are not believers today, it's important to say, hey, wait a minute. What you necessarily think the Bible says, it doesn't mean that the Bible says that. We'll look at a few of those in a moment. And so as men began to debate church tradition versus what the scripture actually said, there became divisions in the church as people had a good-natured heart to serve God and get back to worshiping as they did in the earliest times of the apostles when they read the word for themselves and obeyed everything that it taught. And that was one thing that began to change. But after this came the Renaissance. And it's pretty congruous with the time frame of the Reformation, okay? But it free, people were now freed from some of the religious oppression, and intellectually minded people pursued vigorous investigation into the fields of science. There was a return to classical Greek literature, philosophy, and art. And our modern knowledge explosion began at that time. With new discoveries in science and astronomy, questioning minds uncovered serious error in Roman Catholic teaching about scientific matters concerning the earth and the universe. At one point, bishops taught that the world was flat because that was the common belief at that time, and they tried to use scripture to support that. We will see in our series accurate that the Bible never taught that the world was flat. In fact, the Bible said that the world was round millennia before anybody ever came to that conclusion. So betrayed by religion, men began to rely on self-expression and experimentation, observation, and human reason to come to knowledge. They, they, they said, we need to question the Bible. And there was a drive to throw off religious authority, corrupt priests, corrupt popes. There was a drive to push that off because the church had done so much damage by being something it was never intended to be. And to do this, they focused their attack on the Bible because the Bible was what the church had clung to, yet the Bible was the false enemy. It was the false religion of Roman Catholicism that actually did so much damage to cause the Bible to, become, to come into question to begin with. So now it was coming from two directions, the Renaissance and the Reformation, and a heated debate on the nature of biblical inspiration raged. With intellectuals now involved, the war of religious denominations became simply a war against the Bible. Theologians, philosophers, and scientists attempted to answer the question, how did God inspire men to write the Bible? And it was essentially a debate of human reason. The answer depended on a person's religious or educational persuasion, not on the actual teaching of Scripture. Scientists at the time rejected the Bible because of the Roman church's false teachings. Yet the church of Rome had survived well during all of these attacks. What ultimately suffered the most damage was people's confidence in the authenticity of God's word. Then we get to the 19th century. 
Most scholars uphold and praise the development of Bible criticisms in the 19th century, something that is what Joanna mentioned a second ago, called higher criticism or historical criticism. Some think of it as the golden age of biblical criticism. In reality, it has done the most damage to people's faith in the Bible, aside from perhaps one other movement yet to come. Higher criticism has been heavily influenced by a, by a movement in Germany called rationalism, which is the philosophy that regards human reason as the chief source and test of all knowledge, even spiritual knowledge. So German rationalism denies the need for divine revelation. Higher criticism has reduced the Bible to merely a human book. It denies its inspiration. Couple this movement with the simultaneous works of men like Charles Lyell and Charles Darwin who reformulated the age of the earth and gave us long geological ages and then the principle or the theory of biological macro evolution one species into another and suddenly man thought they could use reason that the entire opening chapters of genesis were nothing but a fantasy or a fable account on par with greek myths or sumerian myths or uh in indo sevastian myths it didn't it didn't matter it was just another set of myths that wasn't possible actual history it wasn't authentic and we find ourselves in an age of atheism or agnosticism, but there's yet one more movement that took place in our history for many of us in our lifetimes, and that was the psychological revolution. Prior to the 1960s, the pseudoscience of psychology and psychiatry had not reached its peak. I know it was founded by other men prior to this, but it began to get its accreditation in our schools and um, even in the Christian realm, beginning in the 1960s, accelerating in the 1980s and the 1990s. And with this came the exaltation of self. Self-esteem, self-virtue, all of the teaching that comes from the modern psychological movement, a movement that is founded by men like Freud and Jung and Maslow, all of who were occultists and atheists who got their information, documentedly got their information from demonic spirit guides. And with the elevation of self came even more anger at the claims of the Bible because what's one of the chief tenets of the Bible? We have to die to self. So now we have an evolutionary worldview, long geologic ages, a history of human reason being elevated over divine revelation. And what originally started out as a way to defend the Bible from tradition that didn't stack up with what the Bible said came to be attacks against the Bible's authenticity, attacks against the Bible's veracity, out of a need to protect self from being put upon the altar that the Bible says it needs to be put upon. And then what happens is we reach the 90s and the 2000s and the decade that we're in now is tolerance gets weaponized against Christianity. And all viewpoints become valid, except for the one that says only one viewpoint is valid. That is, a, in brief, a history of biblical criticism and the events that have shaped to get us to where we are at now. I hope you find that helpful. Let's very quickly discuss, if we can some minor criticisms of the Bible. Some criticisms <coughs> that you'll probably be familiar with. Criticisms all that we're going to answer in this series with forthcoming sessions. One of the biggest ones that you're constantly going to come up with, one of the ones that I hear all the time, is that the Bible is just a translation. How can you be sure the Bible is the same now as when it was written, given that it's been copied and translated so many times? Again, the theory is that each and every time there has been a copy of the Bible made, that human nature has caused errors to creep into the transmission of the text. And so one of our challenges in this series is going to be to debunk the myth that error has crept in. 
Another argument that often gets raised is there's so many copies, there's so many manuscripts, there's so many copies of copies of copies of copies, and if you have a copier, this is one of the ones they love to use, you've got a Xerox machine, and you take an original and you make a copy of it, and then you take that copy and you put that on and you make a copy of that, and then you take that copy, eventually it begins to fade, it begins to lose. That might not be so true today with today's digital machines, but back in the day, that's where these criticisms of the Bible started to come from. We are going to make the case in this series that yes, the Bible has more manuscript evidence for its existence than any other ancient text in existence. And because of that bountiful amount of information that is precisely what allows us to trace back the original message, we openly admit in this series that the autographs, that's a term you might want to write down, that doesn't mean a celebrity who signed something for you. In this sense, an autograph means the original copy. The original copy of Matthew. The original copy of Luke. The original copy of Exodus. We do not have the autographs of the biblical books. Due to a lot of reasons that we'll cover in an upcoming session, the texts, the, the, the types of materials that were used, they did not hold up, so they had to continue to make copies in order to keep the text alive. But they went to incredibly extreme measures when making those copies to ensure that those copies were accurate. And because of that, we have a lot of copies today, even though we don't have the original copies. And some critics like to say that because we don't have the original copies, we can't possibly know what the original was. That is a false assumption. Because we have such an abundance of copies, we can easily detect when a copy is aberrant or a copy is different from all the others and exclude it as not being part of the norm. Do you understand what we're saying? The more evidence you have, the more evidence of what the normal was. And the easier it is to identify what was not normal. And so people would have been able to determine those things. And that's one of the things that we're going to look at very closely in this. Let's, let's look at some other false impressions, though. <clears throat> one of our members here, they often say they, that they had a relative that says, well, I, one thing I know about the Bible is it says God moves in mysterious ways. Except... The Bible doesn't say that anywhere inside of it. There are false impressions that people have today because they've had heard idioms or they've heard cliches. They've heard so many things about the Bible instead of actually knowing what the Bible says for themselves. And I've said in the past that, you know, reading the Bible today is something that people are somewhat afraid to do because it uses bigger words sometimes than, than a lot of people's vocabularies. It talks about histories and cultures that people aren't necessarily familiar with. It uses sentence structures that, that today, because we don't have the emphasis on grammar or the emphasis on how to properly construct a sentence, that, that we can feel uncomfortable reading even though there have been many attempts by good people to try to bring the Bible into modern language, there are things that are lost sometimes when we do that, and there are more accurate translations. We need to understand the difference between a translation of the text and a transliteration of the text. A translation is a, something that comes from the original language and seeks to hold as close to that as is possible. A transliteration takes a translation and tries to make it comfortable to read. That would be something like the living Bible, okay? It's not a direct translation of the text. It's a transliteration. It makes it comfortable. We don't base our studies of the Word of God on a transliteration. It's just easy reading. But if you think the Bible is hard to read or the sentence structures is hard, don't blame that exclusively on the Bible. Go back and look at the work of Dickens. Go back and look at... Herman Melville, go back and look at the, the authors of novels of, of, of more ancient times, even read John Milton in the Middle Ages. We have degraded our ability to communicate in our own 
language of English over time to the fact that we want simplicity and sound bites today. We've gone from having epic poems to having James Patterson two and a half page chapters because people don't have the patience. Because we want it to sound and feel like we communicate today instead of what people would have communicated like in times past. And it's to our detriment that we don't educate ourselves about classic literature, non-biblical classic literature. It's also to our detriment that we don't study the word of God for ourselves. How about the Bible says that God helps those who help themselves. A lot of people think that that's a scripture. I think it comes out of Second Opinions chapter 1, verse 1. It's not a scripture. A lot of people believe that the New Testament books were written centuries after the events that they describe. We can prove that most New Testament books were written decades after, not centuries after. Within the lives of the witnesses of the people who actually experienced it. The earliest New Testament manuscripts only go back to the 4th or the 5th century. That's what, that's what some people think to be the case. It is not necessarily the case. <clears throat> Again, impressions like the Bible says the earth is flat. I realize there are people out there today that claim to be Christians and also claim to be flat earthers. That doesn't mean that's what the Bible states. Again, just because you've heard a Christian or someone who claims to be a Christian say something doesn't mean they are representing what Scripture says. The Bible says that the earth is the center of the universe. Absolutely not. And new errors were introduced with each translation. How many of the above statements do you think are true? How many have you heard people say to you? None of these statements are true. There are presuppositions that exist today. Presuppositions like naturalism and materialism. And so because we don't see God stopping the sun today... And causing something like the long day of Joshua in Joshua chapter 6, we assume that that could never happen because we don't see miracles today. Miracles couldn't have happened back then. Everything is as it was today. That's not a fair presupposition. We don't know everything about how the universe functioned in the past. Maybe there are evidences that archaeologically prove that cities' walls can fall down. And we study those. What proof is there? We can't afford to just dismiss it out of hand. So is the Bible reliable? We can break down the question of whether the Bible is reliable into four subcategories or questions. And we're going to come back to these over and over again. So I encourage you to write these down. Authenticity or textual reliability is what we have now a fair representation of what was first written. Accumulation. How do we know the right books were chosen to be in the Bible? That's a big one for a lot of people. Accuracy, factual reliability, is what we have now a fair representation of what actually happened. And finally, authority, doctrinal reliability is what we have now a fair representation of what God wanted to communicate to us. It's important. So as we wrap up this session, let's talk about some major criticisms of the Bible. Now, previously to this point, to my local audience here, I know we've discussed a lot of that stuff in the past. This is where we're headed into some new territory that we didn't cover the last time we've done this series because I know for your growth and your development, you need to be able to debunk a few of these things. Most of this information is going to be, going to be new from an apologetic standpoint to, to, to most of you. And so, um, you know, I would be surprised if, if uh, some questions aren't answered at, for you at this point. So as we mentioned a few minutes ago, we have what is called higher or historical criticism. Now, historical criticism is the process by which modern scholars examine the text of ancient documents 
and try to determine when they were truly written and whether or not they were authored by the person whose name is on the document. The problem is they operate with a lot of unfair presuppositions when this is applied to Scripture. In fact, when this is applied to Scripture, the usual results of historical or higher criticism are that most of the books of the Bible were not authored in the time they claim, nor by the authors whose names they bear. That was the accomplishment of this so-called higher criticism in the 19th century. So Genesis through Deuteronomy was not written by Moses and not during the time of the exodus from Egypt. First and second Chronicles was not written during the era of the kings of Judah. Jonah was not written by Jonah. Mark, Matthew, Luke, John did not write the gospels that bear their name, etc., etc., etc. We are going to demonstrate that in each case, not only does the Bible claim that it was written by those people and then have it backed up by Jesus himself, but that the historical evidence points to the fact, despite all the critics' attempts to the contrary, that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible and that each successive book after that period was written by who it was claimed to be written by. That gives us a lot to hang our hat on when it comes to the issue of authenticity. So debunking higher criticism. Now I want to show you one of the biggest things that came out of higher criticism, and it's something called the documentary hypothesis. Has anybody ever heard of the documentary hypothesis? I did not think so. So put your th thinking hats on, because this is, this is something that a lot of liberal scholars, even biblical scholars, men and women who have based their entire life on studying the Bible, they adhere to this. And this is where a lot of the manure that needs to be shoveled out of our churches comes from. Okay? <clears throat> what they do is they take the first five books of the Bible. They also do something very similar with the book of a Isaiah and other places like that. But I'm just going to show you the the Torah, as they look at it. And they say it can't possibly have all been written by Moses, okay? The reason they say that it can't possibly have be, been written by Moses is that during Moses' time, they didn't even have a writing system with which he could have written it all down. And there was a great documentary that just came out earlier this spring called Patterns of Evidence, The Moses Conspiracy. It was in theaters up here. It was worth watching. Um, they produced a very, very easy to understand um, adventure through history that proves that, yes, there was a language at that time. Yes, it was a form of Hebrew before Hebrew was normalized to what it was in the times of, of uh, uh, Babylon and so forth. And yes, they had enough access to it that Moses could have wrote those first five books. It's a great documentary. We're going to do our own version of it here, but it's well worth your time to go through that information. Instead of that, what they bring to you here is they, they posit that there was at least four authors, uh, the Yahwist, the Elohist, the Priestly, and the Deuteronomist. Sometimes the Deuteronomist gets called the Redactor because uh, he went through and just cleaned up what the other guys did, kind of like an like a editor-in-chief. And look what they claim. They claim that the Yahwist writer didn't write his portions of the first five books of the Bible till 800 B.C. That'd be about... Uh, 112 or 100 years after David was alive. The Eloist, he didn't write his portions to about 50 years after that. The priestly guy, he didn't write his portions till around the period of Ezekiel and Ezra, which would have been around 586 B.C., somewhere in there. And uh, this Deuteronomist guy, whoever he was, he wrote under the high priest Hilkiah and King Josiah around 621 B.C. So they're saying that the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, the stories of Abraham, the story of Joseph, the stories of the Exodus, all of the law, none of it was written until thousands plus years after it happened. That's the claim that they make. Now, how do they make this? Now, the Yahwist guy they break this down because they say, well, they pretty much called God Yahweh in the places where they wrote. And in other places, this Eloist guy, they pretty much used the term Elohim for God. So that must have been a different author because you never one author would never use two different names for God, right? That'd just be weird. It had to be two different guys. 
their verbiage changed a bit, the way they parsed things changed a bit, the way they handled uh, their approach to God changed a bit. And so it had to be different authors. It's, it's not like over the course of one man's life, he could have written certain ways early on and then, you know, different ways decades later. Imagine applying that to an author today. An author today, he could have wrote novels in his young career, and then maybe he went on to write a screenplay. And a movie got made out of that screenplay. And then the advent of the internet came. Maybe it was Tom Clancy or Michael Crichton or Robin Cook, right? They started writing in the 80s. And then the internet came. And the next thing you know, they're blogging and they're vlogging and they're communicating in new ways. No, that would have had to have been different people because people can't change over the course of their lives. It's the basic claim that they're making here. Obviously, that's not true. But this is how they break down the authorship of the first five books of the, of the uh, Bible. They, those vertical colored bars show different points. In fact, it's a little hidden on the screen, but at the bottom you got Genesis, then Exodus, then Leviticus, then Numbers. And you can see Leviticus was pretty much all written by that priestly codex guy. But Genesis, man, it was broken up by that redactor in black and the priestly guy's in there in some places and then that Yahweh guy, he's got a lot of it, but that Elohist guy comes in and they just kind of piecemealed it all together. How can we trust that any of this is actually the word of God that it claims to be when so many people were editing up and writing over what somebody else said? Meanwhile, the Bible says that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. We get to Jesus and he says, if you don't believe Moses, how will you believe me? Another one that we have to tackle is old earth creationism. And I borrowed this stat from the folks at Answers in Genesis. It was published with their book Already Compromised, which was a statistical survey of our Christian colleges. Christian colleges. <coughs> the Bible claims that the earth is approximately 6,000 years old. And in the science departments in the right-hand column, you will see that 57% of Christian college science departments believe that there is a young earth. Only 34% believe in the old geological ages that support the theory of evolution. What is shocking is if you look at the left-hand column, 77% of the religion department believe that Genesis is not true in its historical account of the creation of the earth, that the earth is actually much older than it claims, and these are the people that are equipping our future pastors, our seminarians, the leaders of our churches to not trust the historical authenticity of the creation account of Genesis. So a major criticism of the Bible is that evolution is true and we have to adapt our understanding of God's creation account to fit into the theory of evolution. And unfortunately, there's an abundance of scientific evidence that says that that is not the case. So I wanted to just bring you up to speed with some of the criticisms that exist in this first session as we go to the break here so that you would understand the types of things that we're looking to debunk in the sessions to come over the next several weeks in order to realize how this will shore up the foundations of your faith and how this will help you, equip you to better answer the questions. If somebody had come at you today and said, well, you're obviously not a believer in the documentary hypothesis, everybody in this room would have went, what? Because nobody raised their hand. You could have been blindsided up the back of the head, not realizing that biblical scholars think Moses didn't write the, the first five books. Over five people wrote different portions of it. And that's why they don't believe in the inspiration of Scripture. They believe it was written 14, 15, 2,000 years after some of those events take place, right? So that's our goal. That's the mission that's in front of us. In the next session, we'll discuss a little bit about what the Bible is, get, a, get an understanding of where it came from to begin with, and then come down to why it's so important. That'll be the second part of our introduction. And um, lots of good information and context in there. So be sure to watch the next session. Let's take a break. <laughs>